you. Thank you. So, um, as she said, I'm Aaron, and I am an introvert. Um, like pretty much all introverts, I have always been an introvert. Like, I was, I was born an introvert. I grew up an introvert. I struggled as an introvert for sure, um, but now I feel like I thrive as an introvert. That path from struggling to thriving for me was very long and extremely hard. But as I look back at it, it didn't need to be. I made it a lot harder on myself by making a few, especially one in particular, bad decisions along the way that I want to make sure that no one else makes. Um, my struggles with introversion really started as a young adult. Uh, as, a, as a child, it didn't bother me so much. Um, maybe some people kind of labeled me as shy, and I, I'm not shy, as it turns out. Um, being shy and being introverted are, are different, and I'm introverted but not shy. Um, but as I, as I became a young adult, I started a business and that's really where I can see that my struggles first started. Um, and that's, I, I, I felt very thankful going into that, that uh, my parents had always owned businesses as I grew up. I thought that I had a good picture into what it would be like to run my own company. I knew that I needed to do a lot more than just be good at web design to succeed at a web, you know, web design company. Um, and I knew that one of those things was going to be bringing in customers, clients, going out and, and meeting people and turning those people into customers and bringing them back in. Uh, and I had seen my dad do this for his company and he was especially good at it. Uh, and my dad and I are alike in a lot of ways, but as it turns out, he's an extrovert and I'm an introvert and I didn't really take that into account. Um, and so I thought that I'd be just as good at it as he had been, and that I would be able to do all the same things that I had seen him do. Um, so I, I was focused in on small businesses. I would go out to where those small business owners were, um, whether that was like Chamber of Commerce or small business association meetings, uh, small tech conferences near me, those kinds of places. Um, when I was first starting, kind of hitting the pavement and finding the customers. Uh, and I, I did it successfully, kind of, but it was so much harder than I had expected it to be. Um, and it took a ton of energy for me to do that. Like, I, I felt exhausted, but I chalked it up to, I just, I'm new to this. I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I need to gain some experience, some practice. And at some point, it's not going to take so much energy to do this. Um, a few years later, uh, I was still succeeding. My business was still growing. And it was still ridiculously hard to get customers the way that I was trying to get them um, the way that I had seen it done, going out to these groups of people and, um, and mingling and talking and, and turning them into customers. And I couldn't figure out why. Why is this taking, why is like 90% of my energy that I have to spend? And I was young, I had a lot of energy. Um, why is all of this being spent in this one area of building my business? Why is this part so difficult? Um, but now I had more connections in my actual arena, in the, the web development space, people that were coming to these same conferences I was. And so I thought I would find the ones that I could see that were doing it really well, the ones that were uh, finishing these conferences energized and excited instead of like just ready to collapse like I felt I was. Uh, and ask them what the secret was, because I figured there's got to be a secret. There's got to be some reason, some thing that they're doing, some little trick that I could learn um, that would make this a little easier. 
And so I talked to several other business owners that were doing the same things, and I asked them, you know, what, what is it? What is the secret? What is your secret? And not one, not two, but every one of the ones that I talked to, they said, ooh, Aaron, there is a secret. And I was like, I knew it. I know there's a secret. They said, you're an introvert and that's bad. You need to become an extrovert. That's the secret. And to be honest, some of you chuckle and I'm kind of glad to hear that because this should have been ridiculous. I should have looked at this and went, you all have no idea what you're talking about, but I didn't because it looked like they knew what they were talking about. They seemed to be more successful in this area that I was struggling in. And so this is that terrible decision I was talking about. I decided I have learned all kinds of other things to succeed in, in my business. I mean, I, I learned how to do accounting and all these other unfun things. I guess I'll learn to be an extrovert. And so I tried to become an extrovert. And suddenly, I, I felt like I had a, a light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. Like, uh, I'm still pouring a lot of energy into this. And it doesn't seem like that level is permanently sustainable, but I won't have to sustain it forever, just until I finally become an extrovert and this gets easier, right? And so I observed extroverts, I imitated extroverts, and at first I kind of thought I was succeeding because I could act like an extrovert very well. Um, people that would meet me at these things, they would think I was an extrovert. Um, but what they didn't know is that it was still taking so much effort, so much energy, and by the, by the end of these conferences, I, I didn't want to be around people, I didn't want to talk to people. Quite honestly, I was like grumpy. I was not happy during this time. It was not going well. A, a few years of this, yes, I didn't learn fast. This is why it was so hard. A few years of this, because I, I kept thinking, eventually, Eventually, I'm going to figure this out. Um, but after a few years, I said, this is not happening. I'm doing something wrong, clearly. Um, I need to know more. I I'm a bit of an information addict. I love having information. I thought, maybe if I can learn more, not just about like how extroverts act, not just about what they do, but about like why they do it. Or, or what makes them tick. Maybe if I could understand the difference better, um, then I could become an extrovert. Still stuck on this. So I start digging into the difference and trying to, to learn more about extroverts, and I was terribly disappointed because one of, the f one of the things that I figured out is you can't just become an extrovert. And this was the, the light at the end of my tunnel, right? This was the idea that, that eventually this was going to get easier for me. I thought that was the only way for it to get easier for me. Um, and then I find out I can't really do that. And, and looking back at this point in my life, I honestly may have just given up on this idea of being a successful entrepreneur, uh, which is what I really wanted to do at the time. Um, if it weren't for the fact that the reason I couldn't become an extrovert was because of science. And uh, I'm, I'm an information addict, like I said, so while I may have been disappointed, I do love me some science. And I was excited to learn a little bit about what all this actually meant, what was going on, what made me different from some other people um, in a very analytical way, which made a lot of sense to my brain. Um, speaking of brains, this is where my, my discovery is, uh, sort of started. Um, and this path down this sort of uh, scientific look at how my brain functions was really a major turning point for me. Um, the thing that I learned first was that Introvert and extrovert brains are different. They are physically, measurably, observably 
different. They work differently. One's not better than the other. One's not superior to the other in any way, but they do function differently. Um, The best way that I can explain this is that everyone has sort of a peak efficiency zone that your brain can be operating in. And when you're in that zone, you can be extremely productive for very little energy costs. You're being really productive, and it's pretty easy to be productive. Um, For me, I literally referred to this as being in the zone, and this would be often when I was sitting in my uh, home office by myself, at my computer, writing code, solving a problem that was really interesting to me, and next thing I knew, hours had passed, hundreds of lines of code had been written, and I wasn't like tired or worn out. I had just been really productive, um, and, and it wasn't hard to be productive at all. But this peak efficiency zone is in different places for everybody. Um, maybe for you, this peak efficiency zone is when you're, you're out with your friends, hanging out, having fun, maybe doing something exciting. You're talking, you're bouncing ideas off each other, and you're being productive in that you're coming up with all kinds of solutions and ideas and things, and it's easy. Like, the ideas are just flowing. Everything is happening. You're operating in that peak efficiency zone. And it feels really good to be there. And this zone sits kind of along a a continuum of um, sort of the level of stimulation that your brain is under, from understimulated all the way up to overstimulated. And so you can be below your peak efficiency zone, and your brain can be understimulated. And generally, when you're like that, you feel... um, Almost like your brain is tired, moving slower than you think it ought to be, but not due to lack of sleep. Just, um, it's just not, cl- things just aren't clicking. And for me, especially, I tend to feel a lack of motivation when I'm understimulated. Um, and it's not that you can't be productive when you are understimulated, but it takes a lot more energy takes a lot more effort. You're having to sort of sink energy into forcing yourself to be motivated and forcing yourself to get things done. And at the end of a day like this, I'll usually look at the things that I got done. It's like, I got a few things done. I I was productive-ish, but I feel like I, you know, ran a marathon or something. I I felt like I I was working so hard and, and got so little done. How can that be? And it's just because the energy cost for that productivity was very high. And similarly, you can be overstimulated. It's the same kind of thing, except for me, this feels more like being um, scatterbrained. You have a, a hundred ideas and solutions flying all around in your head and grabbing onto one long enough to focus in on it and actually accomplish anything um, is very hard. And again, I can be productive when I'm in that state, but it takes a lot more energy. I have to force myself to be focused. I have to make myself stop and focus in on a thing and actually get it done. And this whole continuum is controlled by two basic, basically controlled. There's, There's lots going on in our brains. They're fascinating, but it's basically controlled by two chemicals in our brains. On the overstimulated side, on as in stimulation increases, that's dopamine. That's something we've probably heard of before. And on the low stimulation side, it's acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that uh, is kind of like our default neurotransmitter. And if you're an introvert, and I won't ask you to raise your hand if you are, but if you're an introvert, it is likely that you love acetylcholine, even though you have probably never heard of it. Um, This is like the default neurotransmitter. It kind of controls how our brain functions when there's not some louder neurotransmitter taking over. Um, And so when you're really relaxed, when you have almost no stimulation, acetylcholine is what is making your brain function, and it's it's highly tied with sort of focus and attention, um, which tends to be on that calmer end of the scale. But then there's dopamine. 
Dopamine is one of those louder um, neurotransmitters in our brain that takes over. And it takes over pretty regularly, if I'm honest, um, and starts to push you up that stimulation scale. And dopamine is used in all sorts of different ways in our body. Um, but specifically for what we care about here, uh, it's heavily tied to the reward system of the brain. Uh, and in, as part of that, it's, it's created in the ventral tegmental area, the VTA here, um, and it's created in conjunction with potential reward, not when something good has happened, but when something good might happen. And that's important to understand. So, so some examples, if you are hungry and you sit down at a table of food, you haven't eaten yet, but your VTA creates a little bit of dopamine to say, ooh, food, we like food, this could be really good. Um, that's a little bit of it saying, hey, there's a potential reward, this could be really good. It doesn't factor in risk at all. Um, so similarly, if you're at a casino roulette table and you put it all on red, uh, your VTA says, ooh, we like money, this could be good. It doesn't calculate that you're more likely to lose that money than win more. Um, it just is telling you, you have the potential for reward. You use other parts of your brain to calculate risk and work those two together to decide if you should actually do a thing. Th this part of your brain, its job is just to say, you should pursue this, it has the potential to be good. Um, for introverts, one of the key things is that being around people, talking and interacting with people, has the potential for reward. It could be good. Um, that person might become a good friend. That, that person, uh, they might be funny. I like funny people, right? Um, there's all these potential good things that could happen from any interaction with a person. And so when you're interacting with a person, your VTA creates a little dopamine. And when you're act interacting with lots of people at a conference like this, your VTA is creating even more dopamine because there is a higher potential for reward. And in introverts and extroverts, the amount of dopamine that's created is roughly the same. Travels through this mesolimbic dopamine pathway, which is routed a little bit different in introverts and extroverts, but that's not particularly important. And it gets to the nucleus accumbens, and here's where it makes a huge difference. Introverts, our nucleus accumbens is much more sensitive to dopamine than in extroverts. So um, uh, you've probably seen brain scans that have lit up bright areas, and that's the area of the brain that's like functioning the most, the brighter it is, the, the more it's lighting up. Um, in an introvert, if they get just a little bit of dopamine and, and they do one of those scans and they can see how the brain is lighting up, and if they want to make the scan look the same in an extrovert, that little bit of dopamine doesn't do it. They need more. It takes more stimulation to get to that same brain functionality. And that's not good or bad, but it is different. Like for me, my peak efficiency zone sits lower on that scale, and as, as I'm sensitive to that dopamine, it pushes me past that much easier. And for me to be most productive, whether it's at work or whether it's in conversations with people at a place like this, I, I need to be uh, in that zone or I am expending a lot more energy to force that to happen. And that's what ends up happening. Um, a lot of how our brains function, a lot of why this works the way it does is because these two chemicals control blood flow through our brains. And so when um, an extrovert is very calm, they've relaxed, maybe read a book, listened to some music, uh, a, a doctor can inject a radioactive isotope and trace the blood through their brain, and it will flow something like this. It stays pretty centralized on a short path. The areas that it's traveling through 
control things like our senses, taste, touch, sight, um, controls the necessary uh, systems in our bodies, like uh, you know, our heartbeat and our lungs. In that same state, uh, with the same amount of dopamine flowing through the brain, in an introverted brain, the blood flows like this. It's a much longer pathway. Now it's traveling through the areas that control empathy, self-reflection, memory, planning, problem-solving, rational thought, like the, the prefrontal cortex, that front section that it's traveling all the way out to, is what we use when we say that we need to think, we need to solve a thing. That's the part of the brain that we're using. Now, extrovert brains, their blood will flow like this too with just a little bit more dopamine, a little bit more uh, stimulation. And when I finally understood all this, when I realized that my, my brain wasn't broken and that those people were wrong, like being an introvert wasn't bad, it was just different, this was a, a, a big aha moment for me. For me, G.I. Joe really had it right. Like, knowing was half the battle. When I finally understood it, was when I could actually start fixing the problem. I thought that, that these struggles that I was dealing with, that I thought that I'd been working to fix them for years and years, working to get better at them, but the truth is, I hadn't even come close to going about it in a useful way. Now that I understood how my brain worked, I stopped trying to succeed as an introvert by becoming an extrovert. And I started just saying, I want to be a successful introvert. And it changed my thinking dramatically, although the first thing I did is go, okay, is that possible? Because I had been told it wasn't. But as it turns out, it absolutely is. There are lots of successful introverts in, in our field, people that, that helped start Microsoft and Apple and Facebook and uh, Google Successful introverts, not people that became extroverts and then got successful, but successful introverts. Um, other people that we might recognize that are kind of tops of their field. And historical figures that we look up to. I mean, who doesn't want to be as cool as Dr. Seuss, right? Like, um, this is, th there were lots and lots of successful introverts, so I could be that. But I, I saw that some of these extroverts had some natural strengths that helped them and made certain things easier for them. So I figured, what are my strengths? If they've, if, if they've got these things they're naturally good at that I struggle with, what, what have I got? What do, what, do, what do I have that I can do easier than them? And I sat down and I made a list of what I thought were my strengths, as well as the things that I thought were maybe easier for me to do um, than some other people. And I encourage everyone, introvert or extrovert, to do this. Having a list like this that you can look at and use to help you make decisions on where you want your career path to go or, or what it is that you wanna do is extremely useful. I've taken what was my list and tried to pare it down to introvert strengths rather than just my strengths, ones that I think apply to many introverts. Notice that not everything on my list was an introvert strength, and yours won't be either. Everyone has things that they're particularly good at for reasons other than just being an introvert or extrovert. Um, the first thing that I put on my list, uh, and I actually struggled with at the very beginning, um, was that I am very content being alone. And the reason I struggled with this is because this was supposed to be a list of strengths, and I had been told that this was not a strength. I had been told and I had believed that this was a weakness. But I realized that there are some times when this is really useful. For me professionally, this was when I had some big, difficult problem to solve, lots of code to write, and I needed to spend several days focusing in on that and kind of ignoring everything else. 
I mean, we've all probably been there for some reason or another, and this didn't bother me at all. I didn't like feel the need to get out and be around people again. I did like I was totally happy. I was in that that peak efficiency zone. I felt like I was getting stuff done, and it felt good. Um, and so it turns out this was a strength, but I needed to adjust to make use of it. So I stopped trying to focus on small business clients, and I started focusing on more enterprise-level clients, ones that had more of these big problems that I was better suited to deal with. Um, the next thing that I came up with was that I was a good listener. Um, and I think that this is largely because there's a lot of potential rewards around in life. Um, as you have now kind of seen and understood how this works, um, you will start to see it everywhere, and a lot of it is outside of your control. There are a lot of times when your VTA is making some dopamine because it sees potential reward, and you're like, but, but please stop, but you can't control it. But there are some things that you can, and as a kid, uh, one of those things was that like, when you speak up, when you're in a big group and you say something, um, there's even more potential for reward. Um, and so I could limit that. It was one of those things that I could control, even though I didn't know what dopamine was or, or why it mattered. It just felt better to sit and listen and only talk when I thought it was important to talk. That was the kind of kid that I was, and it was because it naturally fit the way my brain worked better. I didn't understand why at the time, but it did, and so it made me naturally into a good listener. Uh, and I do want to stress that these aren't things that extroverts can't do. There aren't things that they can do that I can't do as an introvert either. It's just that these are things that are naturally easier for introverts than extroverts, or at least seem to be. They can practice being good listeners too. I just practiced it naturally because it's just what I did. Similarly, um, I tended to be very prepared for things. Looking back, I realize the reason why is because as you prepare for a thing, as I prepare for a talk like this or an event like this, some of those potential rewards my brain recognizes them while I'm preparing, and it's like the, the dopamine that's created, that stimulation, can come over time during preparation rather than all coming all at once while I'm like up here on stage or while I'm here at an event talking or while I'm in a business meeting with a, a bunch of clients. It kind of spreads that out, makes it much more manageable. So naturally, I had an easier time being prepared because it was just a thing that I always did. And again, both good listening and being prepared helped me as I moved more into targeting my business at these more enterprise clients and that kind of stuff, trying to work with my strengths. When I was in some meeting with uh, a CEO and a bunch of technical people and there was lots going on and I just needed to um, make sure that I didn't miss anything. Being a good listener and already being prepared and having you know, known everything that I could before the meeting, hugely useful. And it just, it played to my strengths. We tend to be calmer um, because that same scale of stimulation is, is the scale that we would talk about being calm versus uh, a bit more excited all the way up through uh, enough dopamine triggers adrenaline and puts you in that sort of fight or flight kind of freak out. Mode. Um, and so when I'm where my brain prefers to be, I'm calmer. And that has served me particularly well over the last year and a half as the security team lead for WordPress because sometimes bad things happen. <laughs> and when they do, everybody freaks out and moves further up that scale. 
Um, and so starting out calmer and moving up the scale some, but still being able to say, okay, I do see the fire, but, uh, you know, I can think through it clearly still. Maybe we can address it this way. Um, that's really useful. Um, it's not a weakness just because I'm not super excited all the time. And the last thing that I want to talk about today is that I was, I had strong written communication. This one I didn't have in the first uh, iteration of this talk when I gave it because I didn't associate it with being an introvert. It was definitely something that was on my list uh, when I had made it, but I didn't associate it with being an introvert. But similar to some of these other things, um, as I've given talks like this and got to then go out and talk to a lot of the introverts uh, and they were a little bit more willing to share with me after hearing my story on stage, um, I saw that this was a common thing. And, and again, I think that it's because just naturally uh, I tended to use written communication instead of meeting people in person because it was one of those tiny areas where I could kind of control the, um, the, the extra...